up, swashbucklers? You're listening to Under the Crossbones, episode number 121. My name is Phil Johnson. I'm your host for the show today and every day. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for telling your friends, sending donations, all that kind of good stuff. You are a good person. My guest on the show today, Colin Woodard. Yeah, finally, we got it. Yeah, finally, this one took some doing. This one took some rescheduling. We had some technical difficulties. There was just trouble just connecting. There was all sorts of stuff that went into the background of this one, but we finally got it together. He and I got on, got together. We had a grid talk, and you're going to hear it in a few moments. Uh, he is, of course, the author of The Republic of Pirates, uh, which if you're a pirate fan at all, you've probably read. But if not, uh, that's cool too. Uh, hang in right at the beginning of the interview. We will we will give you a little dimester tour of what the book is about, and uh, and so you can you can catch up from there. But he's also written lots of other books. He's written one called American Nations, another one called American Character, one called The Lobster Coast. He's written a bunch of cool stuff that I still have to get around to reading as well. I'm I'm uh, they look really cool, and I haven't had a chance to read them yet. So I'm going to do that. Fun fact about the number 121 for the episode number 121, a Chinese checkers board has 121 holes. Now, you probably haven't played Chinese checkers in a long time. Neither have I. But that's the, it's one, it's got the round board with like a six-pointed star on it. And it's got a little multicolored balls that you jump over each other. I haven't played that in ages, man. Uh, but I remember it was fun to play next Played with my uh, my little friend next door when I was a kid. Played with Nikki DeBerry, and we used to play Chinese checkers and uh, and and chew uh, that that stripy gum, whatever that stripy gum was. I'm just having a moment of flashback now, all thanks to Chinese checkers. <laughs> so we're gonna get to Colin Woodard here in a moment. Uh, I had an amazing, fun weekend. I uh, jetted out to the Midwest. See, some people will jet to the coast. Uh, one coast or another for the weekend. No, I jet to the Midwest to tell jokes. And uh, I had a show Friday night in um, uh, Andover, Minnesota at a place called The Courtyards. Very fun show. They packed it out. Food was good. The audience was good. I had a good set. Uh, and it was just, it was great. And then the next day I drove three hours out to Superior, Wisconsin to play VIP pizza there in uh, in Superior. And that was also a fun show. It was, great. again, great food, great people. It was a blast. It was one of those uh, really cool weekends where I go, yeah, man, I love being a comedian. And then the next day, I drove three hours back into Minneapolis, Minneapolis, Minneapolis to go to the airport and uh, left my hotel kind of early that day. Took a leisurely drive, listened to some great podcasts. I was listening to Carl, uh, Carl Verhaven. Man, I can never pronounce that guy's name. On uh, uh, No Guitar Left Behind. If you're a guitar player, that's a really great uh, uh podcast uh from guitar player magazine and they had carl on there talking about his stuff he's a big session guy and whatever does movie soundtracks uh and then i listened to um what was the other one? Oh, a breakdown of led zeppelin 4 on the great albums podcast so that i just, just enjoyable music podcast cruising down the highway a little bit of snow uh got to minneapolis a little bit early and had lunch at the mall of america which i'd never been to mall of america before and uh, it is uh, it's most famous for having an amusement park in the middle of the mall. And other than that, it is uh, just a large mall. That's pretty much it. But it's not just a large mall. It is all the malls. Like, there is no mall store you can think of that isn't in there. Like, sometimes you walk into a mall and you'll be like, oh, this mall doesn't have a Sephora. They have a Sephora. Oh, this mall doesn't have a, a Kiehl's. There's a Kiehl's. Oh, this mall doesn't have... Whatever it is, it's there. So, if you ever need a mall where all the malls are, then you go to Mall of America. Uh, and uh, I never need to go there again because that was plenty. I'm not a mall guy. <laughs> but it was a really uh, great uh, long weekend. I flew home, got got back in about, uh, about 1 o'clock in the morning, Sunday night, and uh, crashed out pretty hard. And now here we are. You know what? Speaking of guitar, uh, you, you may know that uh, besides telling jokes and talking about pirates, uh, that I am a musician and a music teacher. I'm a guitar teacher. And one of the projects I have been working on over the last few months is a guitar program uh, to to uh, help people besides my private students. My private students have already been using the program for a long time. But 
What I've got going is a, called the 30 Day Guitar Challenge. If you have ever wanted to learn how to play guitar, uh, you can learn how to play guitar. Well, you can learn how to play three songs on guitar, very specifically, three songs in 30 days with just 10 minutes of playing each day. So this is my new project I'm working on. If you have ever thought about learning guitar and you would like to learn guitar, here's what you do. Go to underthecrossbones.com slash guitar. Real easy, underthecrossbones.com slash guitar. You can sign up for the 30-day guitar challenge. It is free, totally free. Uh, and uh, and it's uh, it's been going really well, so I'm excited about it. So if you want to check that out, go to underthecrossbones.com slash guitar. We are, of course, also sponsored today by Tee Public, working with independent t-shirt designers, and I have curated over 100 really awesome pirate t-shirts uh, for you to check out that you can get funny ones, sexy ones, scary ones. There's all sorts of great pirate shirts there. So go to check those out. Go to underthecrossbones.com slash shirt, and you can see all these shirts that I have handpicked for you uh, for uh, for goodness sake. I didn't didn't know how to end that phrase, but for goodness sake, seem seem good. It's holiday season and all. So be good, for goodness sake. Go buy a t-shirt. <laughs> I have a couple more shows coming up this uh, this month. Just a couple little ones. Uh, December the 15th, that's this Friday, I will be at uh, Comedy Oakland at the Howden Restaurant in Oakland, California. And then December 20th, I will be uh, popping in for a guest set at Cobb's Comedy Club in San Francisco, California. More tour dates coming up, of course. You can always go to uh, underthecrossbones.com, click the tour dates button. You can find out where I'm going to be. If you're enjoying the show, join us on Facebook, facebook.com slash under the crossbones, Twitter slash under crossbones, no the, uh, and uh, be sure you subscribe through uh, Apple podcast or Stitcher or Google play or Spotify, wherever you like to listen to uh, podcasts, make sure that you hit that subscribe button so that you get the new episodes in your, uh, in your device. Uh, first thing every Tuesday morning, that's when they come out. And of course you can get all the show notes for this episode at under the crossbones.com slash one, two, one. All right. So we are going to talk to Colin Woodard. Like I said, this is, this one took some doing to get together, but I was so glad to be able to get to do it. Cause of course the, the Republic of pirates is one of the go-to scholarly books on that particular period of the golden age of pirates. Right. Even uh, when we talked to James Hart back on episode 114, when he was talking about uh, putting together the idea for the NBC TV show Crossbones, the Republic of Pirates was, that was his, he read that and he was like, I need to do a show about this, right? So uh, it's an important book. If you haven't read it, it's a fantastic read. It's scholarly, but it's not tedious. It's not a textbook. It's really a great read. And uh, it's uh, it's the go-to resource these days. Uh, it's It's like as if it were the Captain Johnson book. But way super more reliable <laughs> and not with a whole bunch of made up stuff in it. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how Colin uh, dug up this particular information and why it was easier to do it now than it was to do it then. Lots of really great stuff there. So let's get into my discussion with Colin Woodard, author of The Republic of Pirates. Enjoy. Uh, your your book, The Republic of Pirates, is considered one of the, the go-to resources for pirate uh, scholarly stuff. <laughs> that was not the good way to say that. Uh, you can tell I'm not a writer. <laughs> Uh, but 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 the it's it's considered one of the go to resources for for accurate pirate knowledge these days. Uh, for the people who haven't read it in the audience, can you give us just the five cent tour of what the book is about? Yes, this is the story of the gang of pirates who are responsible for like ninety percent of all of our pop culture pirate imagery and legend. Uh, these are the real pirates of the Caribbean, so the one that's that. Um, that created the source material that was later drawn on by Robert Louis Stevenson and the Disney corporation to create almost all the great pirates of fiction you've heard of from, sure. you know, uh, long John silver straight through to Jack Sparrow. And, uh, it follows the lives of these, of the key members of this group of pirates who amazingly were active for just a few years uh -huh. at the beginning of the 18th century and who all, you know, knew each other or had served with each other on uh, vessels or had like one degree of separation from each other who operated out of a shared um, uh, base or pirate republic in the failed British colony of the Bahamas Islands and for a brief period uh, in the uh, 1717 and 1718 had brought the uh, commerce of all of the transatlantic empires to a standstill and were threatening the uh, the the 
colonies with uh, invasion and uh, worse and had the Royal Navy on the run. The other books that you've written have not been pirate books. So what was it about uh, that story that made you want to write about it? And how do you think it connects to your other your other work? Well, the common themes of my work um, up to the pirates had included maritime and oceans things. Okay. And the common theme of all the work since pirates and including it have been history and colonial history. Okay. So that book is kind of the, the pivot point where I started getting more involved in history. Um, but the evolution of it was that um, I've long believed that the real answers to you know the great American questions about who we are and what sort of country we're supposed to be and why we have fractious differences uh-huh. um, are all to be found in the very poorly understood colonial period. Mm. I mean, the, the history most of us received in school about what the colonial period was about is completely wrong and really, really unhelpful uh, because the colonial period was strange and messy and the least likely outcome of it all was that you would have a, you know, continent spanning unitary uh, superpower called the United States emerge out of it. That was the (laughs) least likely of options. And understanding its history, which is absolutely fascinating, um, it would, you know, would be a great asset for the country. And um, I'd written a book that had had me diving into the colonial history story about uh, Maine, where I live, and its um, cultural background and why it's the way it is and, and why we have our various social peculiarities and pathologies here. Uh-huh. But in doing that, I was at the time that I was ended up contemplating Republic of Pirates, I was looking for, I guess, a vehicle to sort of exploit. How could you draw a mass audience into the colonial world so that they would understand it. What would be the, you know, the, the carrot uh, right. to bring in for them? And I was thinking about, you know, dinosaurs are too early, but, oh, pirates, you know, they're right in the middle of it all. They're uh-huh. drawing the various, um, you know, that they're, they're, many of them are from England in the, uh, in the old world. They're operating in a theater of operations that extends uh, from, you know, Venezuela, what's now Venezuela on the Spanish main, all the way up to Newfoundland. Uh, they're raiding um, uh, slave vessels and linking Africa and the transatlantic world together. Um, how perfect is that? Uh, and, and it sort of links um, all of the various strands of the colonial world together. So uh-huh. I was like, great, you know, we'll, we'll write about pirates. Everyone's interested in those. And I can draw people to, to learn about the world by accident. Okay. <laughs> and what ended up happening is, I mean, that worked in a sense, but as I started diving into the story of these pirates and who they really were, their story was so unexpected and unlike the one you received uh-huh. that I was kind of hooked. So the pirate story itself became so compelling, um, you know, beyond using it to educate people about the colonial period. I ended up taking on the big questions about America's uh, identity and colonial past in American Nation, the history of the 11 rival regional cultures of North America, which is the next book that came out. Um, and But Republic of Pirates was part of my process in getting towards that and also in diving into the colonial. That's really cool. I have a, a couple of questions about that. First, I have to read American Nations. I haven't read that one yet, but it seems really, really interesting. Um, my two questions are, since we what we learned about colonialism is not necessarily correct, what what is one big thing that you found about that history that that you would like people to know about that wasn't that we didn't learn in school? Well, the essential thing is that the colonies, even the British colonies, um, weren't you know, they were established separately. They were established as different projects at different times by people with completely distinct ethnographic and religious and political characteristics. Mm-hmm. In other words, each one of them, each cluster of colonies was a separate society and, you know, nation uh, with very little in common with one another. You know, better yet, once you add the the Dutch settled area around what's become New York City or the uh, the Spanish settled area in the what's now the southwest of the country and the, uh, the, the French impact. I mean, once you uh, look at all of those things, you realize that we really are a group of separate nations or countries or people right. that ended up as part of a federation um, against, you know, initially to fight off a common enemy in terms of the British imperial policy and the changes that happened in the 1770s. But that fact has 
Um, <laughs> once you sort of realize it and realize what the characteristics are of those different colonial areas and the fact that each of them settled a mutually exclusive strip of the country out way beyond the Mississippi up through the 18, uh, 1840s or 1850s, mm -hmm. which is the time when you start first getting significant you know, immigration from outside of these areas. Right. But once you realize those things and that the, the, the geography of it, everything from the way our constitutional arrangements were put together, the constitutional convention through contemporary voting patterns uh, suddenly start making sense and they don't follow state boundaries. No, certainly not. And I've always found it uh, both amazing and confusing that a country as large as the United States and as populous as the United States has ha, can hang together as much as it does. Yes, yeah. Because I travel all over the country as a performer, so I, I, I see all these different places. I meet all these different people, and I see how different they are. And it is like going to a new country when I go from California to Indiana to Florida. It's like – it's I, I feel like I need a passport sometimes. Absolutely, and sometimes that happens within the states themselves. I mean, I lived in southernmost Texas in the lower Rio Grande Valley, and that's a completely different universe than, say, you know, the, the hill country, uh, you know, between Austin and Dallas. Certainly, Or yeah. even eastern Texas, you know. Or, and within California, the difference between the coastal plain and, and the interior is quite extraordinary, or between the south that has a, a precedent in New Spain and the Bay Area, which largely was uh, settled and colonized in a collision of New Englanders and uh, arriving by sea and Appalachian people arriving by wagon. I mean, the histories and the background are entirely different, which, you know, fuels the, you know, the talk about California being <laughs> separate places or maybe need to be broken up. Right. But yeah, it's extraordinarily complex. And those differences, you know, I, I lived in Europe for about five years and traveled all over the place covering it as a journalist. But you know, the differences in many respects between our component regional cultures are, you know, as wide in terms of fundamental values and and consensus ideas about how society should be put together as wide as between any two European Union nation states today, which is pretty remarkable given, you know, that we have a, uh, in theory, a, a closer cultural proximity, but not really. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and, you know, in the pirate era, people would, you know, nobody would have questioned that. Nobody thought of of the New England colonies and the young colony of South Carolina as uh, having any more in common with one another than they did with the English colony in Jamaica or uh, or the Bahamas or or, uh, or 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 even the uh, places that are now part of uh, Canada. I mean, they were they were very distinct places and thought of themselves as such, and the people who lived in them would have considered their country, in quotes, to have been, you know, South Carolina or Massachusetts or Virginia, not not anything about British North America having any cohesive identity. Right. So do you think then that if we were to think about the U.S. as something more like the European Union rather than a single country, but as a country that's got many different cultures, do you think that would uh, lead to some sort of better decision making or at least easier decision making? Well, I think the the – the differences which have always been with us between the regional cultures, the, the, the American nations and their respective, you know, ideas about what freedom means and what the right relationship between church and state is and all these kind of issues are, are so large um, that it's always encumbered us. But uh -huh. it encumbers us more when we don't really realize what's going on. I mean, the first step <laughs> is to understand what we're arguing about sure. and, and why. And then you might be able to work your way back to how to build better consensus. And as a practical matter, I mean, you're never going to bring the, the, the more opposed, um, polarly opposed parties together. Sure. What has happened throughout our history and allowed us to move forward is you've had a coalition of these regional cultures built and isolating one or the other of the sort of superpowers. You know, the, there's the Deep South and there's the greater New England space called the Yankeedom, each of which has usually led a coalition against the other in most of the great political frictions and decisions in our country. Uh -huh. And which one has been in power federally has over a decadal time scheme usually has to do with what kind of coalition they were able to put together of the other regional cultures who weren't so sold. Uh -huh. And we we haven't had that. We haven't had one block um, have decisive control in Washington for uh, two or three decades now, uh -huh. which means you know we're that is why we've been stalemated and government has become more and more dysfunctional at the federal level. Is that nobody really has the consistent power 
you know, to do things over a long period of time. So the, the solution has to do with understanding what we're fighting about and one or another political, you know, a, a political vehicle coming forward that can deliver a set of policy ideas that would give you a supermajority of the regions in one direction or another to allow the country to move forward. Interesting. Because yeah. we, can't, we can't stay, you know, stalemated forever because right. <laughs> you know, we, we, we can't pass budgets and stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just one guy undoing what the other guy just did all the time. Yeah. It's insane. So, um, yeah. right. And not, not being able to, to do anything about longer term problems that have to be dealt with by any country, but certainly by a global superpower that, you know, have more than a two or four year time horizon. And that, that needs to change as well. Sure. The country's going to succeed or even hold together. Yeah, absolutely. So as you were digging into these pirate stories, um, before, your book, there was not a lot of trustworthy information on these particular characters or or the story of what was going on at that time. So tell me a little bit about what your research project process was like and and what you uh, what going in, what your expectations were and maybe how they changed as you were writing. Well, I guess my goal was I wanted to know, you know, the, the, the pirates have remained famous as sort of, you know, anti-heroes uh-huh. ever since they, you know, were in operation. Mm-hmm. How can that be? Why is it that we celebrate this group of, you know, presumably thieves and ruffians? Why, right. why, <laughs> why do we have an entire um, industry, an entertainment industry, and movie franchises, and novels, and, you know, kids, Halloween costumes, and cartoons, and everything uh, around this group of people? What was it about them that kicked that off? Uh-huh. What were these people really like? I mean, they couldn't have just been floating around, you know, singing sea shanties and uh, digging holes and tossing treasure in it. Right. Why were they doing what they were doing? So I had those basic um, questions going into the project, but I quickly discovered that almost all the received myth or legend about these pirates all came from one peculiar book that was published while some of them were still active and alive. Uh-huh. The General History of the Pirates, yeah. Sold of the Wall. I published in 1724 in London, which became a bestseller on both sides of the Atlantic. And this essentially lays out the myth that everybody else has picked up ever since. Most sure. of everything you've heard about these, these pirates, who include Blackbeard and Black Sam Bellamy of Witta fame and the gentleman pirate Steed Bonnet and the women pirates Ray Reed and Anne Bonny and the Calico Jack Rackham and all, all of these pirates who are all part of this one gang, everything you've heard about them basically comes from this book. Right. And the book is a strange combination of things that once you try to fact check it and, and tie it back to original sources and records, it's either absolutely correct copying uh, official privileged documents verbatim uh-huh. or completely made up. Like some, they just made it made up whole, whole sets of stuff to make the the text more exciting. Right. And there's other parts of it where we don't know which it is because if they're source documents, they're missing, mm. but the story kind of is consistent with what we know, but we, you know, the, whatever the source was, was lost. So it's a confounding book. And that was kind of the beginning digging backwards and saying, well, what's the real story? And, and to approach that research wise, to do basically a biography of the, 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 the three most important pirates who would tell you the story through their lives and the person who confronted them and tried to bring them down a a privateer named Woods Rogers Mm -hmm. to do that, um, required digging your way back to original sources. And, you know, I would have spreadsheets laid out, you know, ultimately ended up being day by day of the chronology of these people's careers, one Uh for each pirate Uh and lining up the spreadsheets to see where they interacted when they were together and when they weren't and laid out all of the allegations in various sources and, you know, working my way back to a previous scholarship and tying down, you know, sometimes people wouldn't know exactly when an event occurred and um, would be describing it in this way and that, but laid them all out and then tried to work through them back to documents or to figure out where un discovered archival information might be that would shed light on what was really going on. And it ended up being a complex project of trying to triangulate the location of missing documents. You could even start plotting where these guys were going in their ships, right? Uh. You would have a confirmed source that on whatever, January 17th, 1717, that, you know, Blackbeard and his fleet were headed northwesterly from this location. You could put it on a map. Okay. And then they show up, you know, a week and a half later at this location. 
where were they in between? Well, you start doing sailing times and and draw a line between them and how long it would take to get from X and Y, you start having a pretty good idea of where they must have been. Uh Um, And and sometimes that intersects with accounts of people being attacked by a pirate that they didn't name in between. (laughs) And you start digging into it, discovering that they're describing exactly the right number of vessels. So you're able to start identifying that that was probably them or, or better yet can then work back and focus on, you know, who was the station ship for the Royal Navy in that area who might have heard about this. We're supposed to be collecting intelligence. And, you you know, you track it down. Oh, it's the HMS such and such. And the captain at the time was so-and-so. Let's find his captain logs and the log books uh, for for that. And the answer to almost all of these questions, you know, finding customs roles, looking through the admiralty records of the Royal Navy for the captain's letters that were sent home, right? There's There's no radio. There's no fax, there's no email, everything is sent by letter. So the entire intelligence gathering apparatus of the British Empire, largely in the form of governors and Royal Navy captains letters back and forth to London, everything that survived is all in one place, right? Uh, Like the entire history of Britain and the British Empire, and therefore our colonial history and the colonial history of all of these Caribbean nations and former British possessions in the Bahamas are all located in one amazing repository, the National Archives of Great Britain you know, in, in Kew Gardens outside London. And okay. that's where I went a couple of times, you know, having triangulated and built spreadsheets to go dig and often find um, the answers that had eluded people previously. Um, and I was also assisted, compared to previous researchers, by the fact that, you know, this book was researched in 2005 and 2006 uh-huh. um, at a time when for the first time... Uh, keyword searchable databases of things that used to be on microfilm, like the giant microfilm collection of (laughs) all of the English newspapers published in the 15th, 16th, and 17th century, like every single one. Uh Well, suddenly those were becoming keyword searchable. So you could search for needles in a haystack. You know, I'm trying to find about a mysterious, you know, merchant captain who might provide a clue and you could keyword search it and get hit. Um, which is something nobody previously could have contemplated that. No, certainly not. How long did it take you to write the book from beginning of idea to publish? You know, I think it was just a couple years of research, maybe even slightly less, but, you know, um, powered by all of those technologies that in the, you know, the, the 10 or 12 years since of, we take for granted, but no previous researcher had had those opportunities. Sure, yeah. So combining the archival research where, you know, at Q, when you go to the National Archives, um, you know, Britain's history is so much older than ours. Yeah. If, if, if you or I went to the Library of Congress and said, hey, I want a document from 1718, you know, it would be like you were, ha- you know, handling, you know, nuclear fuel rods. You know, they'd <laughs> right. put you in a suit and they'd, there'd be cameras around you and a guard with a, you know, stick ready to smack you if you touched it. And, you know, you'd be wearing gloves and everything else. No, there you'd request these documents, the originals from, you know, 1690 or 1718, uh-huh. and they would just show up. You'd open up a box and there they are, right? right? And you're actually handling them. You're, you're turning the log books that are, you know, from a storm have the, the, the stains of the, of the seawater that splashed on them, you know? Yeah, right. And so you have this unbelievable access because, you know, in Britain, they're like, Oh, you know, early 18th century, knock yourself out. You know, we're worried about the medieval stuff, right? right. <laughs> we got loads of that colonial stuff out back. You know, they're worried about the Magna Carta. They're not worried about this stuff. So it's a pleasure to dig in that. And then you can combine that with all of the digitization of newspapers and published sources from that time period that, you know, allowed one to do the work of 100 grad assistants single handedly. And so I think that's why this book was able to assemble the story for the first time as in part because the tools were available to ask research questions and dive deeper than people could have previously. Yeah, that's that's really intriguing. I hadn't even thought about the just the technology part of it making it easier like that. And and, and you're right. I, I was in London earlier this year and we were actually getting um, historical fatigue, if that's even a thing, <laughs> where we were just like, oh, oh, that's from the 1700s. I just saw a Bible fragment from, uh, you know, 900 over there. So big deal, you know, <laughs> exactly. Changes your perspective a bit. Yeah, it really, it really does. It really does. Just from a um, a practical standpoint, were you writing this book while keeping up with other journalistic assignments and things like that? Uh, yes. Uh, at the time, I wasn't a staff writer, uh-huh. but I was still doing uh, still a uh, foreign correspondent for some big newspapers, the Christian Science Monitor and the 
San Francisco Chronicle and uh, still doing overseas assignments on those things and, you know, speaking engagements related to my past books and all that kind of stuff. So, yes, although I made this a primary focus of what I was doing a lot of the time. So, you know, on some of the trips, you know, when I was going to somewhere, you know, North Carolina or to Britain, I'd usually have some assignment on the side of some sort. But I was, in fact, uh, you know, doing other stuff at the same time. You must have some fantastic time management skills. <laughs> you know, you get good at multitasking. I don't know if they're excellent, but, you know, you, you, you get used to it. Yeah, you know, the I'm same sure. way the younger generation can can multitask and, you know, watch two television programs at once on two devices. Um, you know, I guess doing all of that multitasking for a long time kind of wires your brain to be able to switch from thing to thing. Yeah, I suppose. So in in looking at these pirates, did you get a sense of what their status was in popular culture at the time? Obviously, the, the governments uh, disliked them or at least pretended to dislike them in some cases. Uh, but what was the what was their status among the population were they folk heroes then yeah that's the amazing thing is that they were folk heroes at the time you know when when they were actually active and they still are today i mean it's nothing changed you know there wasn't a moment where the the pirates uh, you know um reputation was rewritten or revised uh-huh. um while they were active it seems that you know the, the, the pirates argument was you know that we're not simple thieves and brigands that were basically fighting a, you know, a social revolution uh-huh. against those who were exploiting ordinary people, including ordinary sailors, that the, the ship owners and ship captains who are making their lives miserable, who are, you know, meeting out brutal punishments or killing sailors on a whim and starving people by not, you know, stocking enough food on your vessel to, to feed the crew as you cross the Atlantic or, uh-huh. you know, petty sadism or the company cheating you out of your wages by paying you in Jamaican pounds instead of English pounds at the end (laughs) of your journey, which are worth, you know, a third as much or all of these various ways in which ordinary people were genuinely being, um, cheated and messed with and sometimes killed. Uh It was all made much worse by the fact that this, uh, there had been a uh, colonial series of wars that preceded the piracy outbreak. And when those wars ended, there was an economic slump and uh, and the Royal Navy got rid of two thirds of its ships and dumped all its sailors on the docks and all the privateering commissions, the permissions from the uh, the, the 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 British uh, monarch to uh, raid enemy uh, shipping during the war. Those were all revoked, and the merchant fleet shrunk. And suddenly, you had all of these sailors with no jobs, and those who did have jobs, their leverage was greatly reduced. So all of the problems that had been there got far, far worse. The exploitation was, was pretty horrific. And that powered these pirates too often mutiny and take over the vessels. But when they did it, they, they, they reacted in a very interesting way. They turned the government of the ship upside down instead of this top down, you know, authoritarian model. Um, they elected their captains uh-huh. by a popular show of hands. They could depose the captain at any time outside of combat by a show of hands of approval or disapproval. They had a, a figure kind of like a prime minister in the in the form of the quartermaster who was elected to keep buys and report on the captain's um, you know doings to the rest of the crew. The treasure was shared almost entirely equally. In our privateering crew, um, you'd share you know half of the treasure with the investors on the ship. And of the remaining treasure you got privateering, you know, the captain would get 14 shares and, and ordinary sailors would get one. On pirate vessels, the captain might get one and a half shares mm-hmm. and all the other sailors would get one equally and there would be no investor to pay to. So it was very egalitarian and they kept the treasure usually um, with the crew on the main deck, not in the captain's quarters. And mm-hmm. um, they had primitive disability benefits set out that before they divided up the treasure, you know, oh, you lost an eye. Here's your two pounds, you know. <laughs> You know, you died. We'll save these four pounds for your widow and all that right. kind of stuff. All of this happening, you know, you know, 60, 70, 80 years before the American Revolution and the storming of the Bastille at a time when supposedly ordinary people, you know, haven't got this radical democratic impulse. And certainly where there's no, you know, idea of, you know, social protection programs in the right. workplace. So it is a, you know, fascinating window on on things that aren't supposed to have been there then. You don't hear from ordinary people very often. And their position that we're Robin Hood's men, as Bellamy put it, uh-huh. um, you know, settling scores on behalf of the exploited ordinary people, this argument 
was accepted by large numbers of ordinary people ashore. Sure. Um, you see it in the letters of elite figures who are very upset with the pirates and decrying them as villains of all nations and devils, and they need to be wiped out to the vermin on humanity. That was said by people like Cotton Mather in Massachusetts or uh-huh. uh, Lieutenant Governor Spotswood in Virginia or the Attorney General of South Carolina and their letters back to London. But in those same letters, all of those individuals were also saying how concerned they were because ordinary people in their colonies in large numbers supported the pirates, mm. that they were leaking information to them and supplying them, in other words, <laughs> cheering them on. When, when Steed Bonnet finally gets captured and is facing execution in South Carolina, there's an uprising in Charleston that almost overthrows the government in an effort to release him. So, I mean, the, the, it's pretty clear, you know, those things and the fact that the general history of the pirates published in 1724, which strangely enough takes a fairly sympathetic view of the pirates and mm-hmm. oftentimes sure. was a bestseller almost promptly on both sides of the Atlantic and remains in print today almost, you know, 400, 350 <laughs> years later or whatnot. I've got a copy on my bookshelf. Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, the, you know, for all those reasons, we, we know that they were – popular at the time and that that anti-hero that anti-hero image had been with them that they were you know fighting against a corrupt system and uh you know taking sort of a libertarian ethic of freedom and it'll be a merry life but a short one but we're going to go live, live as free men that argument seemed to win the day now of course the pirates were you know they're they were taking uh, from the rich and giving to the poor, but the you know the designated poor were themselves right. so you know you can you can parse their argument but the point is that Many ordinary people um, uh, accepted their argument, um, not that of the authorities. In, in what ways were they communicating that to the populace at large? Because I would think that the the governments and authorities would be able to basically squash most communication. Whereas now we would they would just put up a YouTube video and tweet about it, and the word would get out that way. Like uh, say the uh, Arab Spring, or you know those types of things. Yeah. What, what types of modes of communication were they using to get that message out? I mean, the only modes of communication in this era, of course, you know, communication moved at the speed of transportation. It was mm-hmm. letters carried by ships from place to place. So much of what people learned was personally face-to-face experiences okay. or hearing things by word of mouth from witnesses or uh, from the one newspaper in all of the Americas in this time period. There was one four-page newspaper in Boston called the Boston Newsletter uh-huh. that took to covering the pirates and their exploits quite a bit. Okay. But the, to the degree to which prior to the publication of the general history of the pirates that people learned about the pirates seems to be from sort of firsthand reputation uh-huh. or word of mouth. So remember, this world is pretty small. I can't remember the figures, but I think you know the biggest city in British North America is Philly, and I think it was maybe you know, 18 or 20,000 people or something like that. Okay. I mean, it was a, a much smaller world than we're used to. Yeah. And people know one another. And, you know, the pirates started numbering in the many thousands. And people would have, you know, tended to know or know somebody who knows somebody involved in piracy or captured by pirates who traded with the pirates. And huh. the pirates come on shore and, you know, raid ships. And word gets around in small communities. So... Um, I think a lot of it during that time period was word of mouth being passed down from person to person as it had always been. And then emphasis, you know, the additional emphasis once the newspapers started covering it and then the newspapers dispatches would be picked up in London and elsewhere. And um, they had also bet, you know, the, the, their idea, their argument that they were, you know, Robin Hood like heroes had a precedent. Um, There was one guy who was kind of a model for them named Henry Avery. And he Uh was a pirate who in the 1690s, a generation before in the 1690s and had, um, had mutinied and done something very much the same. And he'd gone and raided ships in the Indian ocean and disappeared without a trace with allegedly huge amounts of treasure. And in the years prior to the outbreak of this that this wave of piracy, um, Henry Avery had become a major pop culture subject okay. in England. Uh-huh. Um, there were plays written about him, novels. I mean, they were, they were all, you know, fantasy things, but the sure. fantasy was that there was a noble king of pirates who'd now set himself up in Madagascar and had, you know, a palace built of gold and, you know, you know, eight, you know, diamonds for breakfast, that kind of thing. <laughs> and, um, this was huge. I mean, you know, every major 
sort of media and pop entertainment um, forum in the late uh, 17th and early 18th century featured Henry Avery. Uh, okay. So what I'm saying is because of that, the idea of this was already in the pop culture and the ether that people would have known about. And okay. then these pirates who definitely were modeling themselves in part off Henry Avery, um, you know, emerged thereafter and grabbed onto that mantle. So they had that precedent. I talk about Avery in the, in the prologue to the book for precisely this reason, because he kind of set the stage um, for them, at least in his, you know, post career or, or, or uh, after death, um, um, you know, entertainment uh, and pop culture stuff that popped up around him. And then finally, you know, once after most of the pirates had left the stage, but once the general history of the pirates came out, that codified everything and sent the myth, you know, at all corners of the world where it's continued to circulate today. Right. Interesting. Were there uh, any other or are there any other resources out there either preceding or after your book that you find really, really accurate that you think people would want to know about? Well, there have been a few people kind of, I mean, super accessible, not exactly, but there have been some people working in more of the scholarly-ish realm who've been digging up, you know, little additional nuggets here and there. Uh-huh. Um, there's a guy named, uh, last name is Bayless, uh, out of North Carolina, who's been exploring the g- genealogical records in Jamaica and elsewhere and has tracked down a whole substantial hypothesis that uh, Blackbeard was from Jamaica and who his parents were and where they came from and all that kind of thing. Yeah, that's uh, Bayless, Bayless Brooks. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, Bayless Brooks. Right, exactly. His work has kind of pushed the envelope further uh, on what we know about Blackbeard's early origins. Um, trying to think. There's a couple other people. Um, Mike Daniel, I wrote a, um, a uh, Smithsonian cover story a couple years back where another researcher who discovered Blackbeard's flagship, Queen Anne's Revenge, uh-huh. Uh, later found in French archives uh, some more accounts of his, or, or the, the the first accounts we have of the last um, uh, pirate raid he made, which also said some more light into his tactics and the like. So there have been little nuggets here and there. I don't think anybody has rolled out a um, you know a, a big substantive book since then that um, pushes the story further along. But slowly, more and more little discoveries are accreting and popping up that give us a you know a a deeper idea of what's going on. Great. Great. What do you have coming up, uh, book wise or, or whatever writing wise that, uh, that people should be on the lookout for? Well, uh, the book on American regionalism, uh, is, uh, out and continues to, to get an enormous amount of attention. Uh-huh. It has a sequel called American character, a, a history of the epic struggle of individual liberty, uh, and the common good, which, um, is sort of a sequel to the regionalism book looking at, the history of the deepest strife in the American conversation and how we would get out of it. Uh And then I'm just, uh, just securing, just, uh, you know, sold my next book idea, uh, but it's a little bit too early to release it, but I've just started at work on, on another work, which will be uh, very much an American history with relevance to the present. Fantastic. And where's a good place online for people to keep up with what you're doing? Uh, you can always find it via colinwoodard.com, one okay. L and one W, and there's a link to a blog that kind of you know keeps up with all the stuff I'm doing, speaking, writing, and, uh, and thinking about, um, which is a good place if you really want to keep track of what I'm up to. Okay, great. Uh, this is fantastic. I will make sure that all that stuff is linked up in the show notes. And uh, Colin, you have been one of the most requested guests on this show. So I'm glad we finally got to do this. I appreciate you taking the time to do it. Thanks much. Glad we were finally able to connect. Yeah. All right, man. I will talk to you again soon. Thanks much. Take care. Goodbye. Right. Bye-bye. And there it is, friends. That is my interview with Colin Woodard, author of The Republic of Pirates and many other fascinating sounding books. If you want to find out more about what he's got going on and dig into more of his stuff, go to colinwoodard.com. And in fact, if you just Google his name, all sorts of stuff will come up because he's a journalist as well. So he writes for a whole bunch of various publications and stuff like he talked about. So you can always just kind of Google his name and find some other great stuff that he's uh, that he's written about. We're sponsored today, of course, by Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast, WKKC-DB, playing the best music and pirate radio talk. 
You can listen to Under the Crossbones on both their stations. Just go to PirateRadioTheTreasureCoast.com or PirateRadioTC.com. And don't forget to download their apps. That is the Pirate Radio Treasure Coast app. That's their music station. And then there's the Pirate Radio Talk app for the talk station. Uh, You can hear Under the Crossbones on there multiple times during the week. And uh, I appreciate them for doing that. And I appreciate you for listening. And if you're listening over there, be sure to come say hi on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. So I know that you're out there. And again, you can get all the show notes for this episode at uh, underthecrossbones.com slash 121. If you need to get a hold of me, you can always uh, email me, phil at underthecrossbones.com. Super easy. Uh, or if you want to leave me a voicemail, tell me about a cool pirate event you've been to or a pirate band you saw or whatever, do that. It's 408 408- Five nine nine two seven three three. That is my voicemail for the show. Again, that's four zero eight five nine nine two seven three three. That's our show for today. Thank you once again for tuning in. I always appreciate it. If you have a friend that does not know about the show yet, the best thing you can do is go tell them about it. Grab their phone from them, subscribe for them on the phone, and say hey, you need to listen to this. <laughs> you want to find out more about my guest today, Colin Woodard? Go to Colin. Woodard.com. That is Colin, C O L I N 1 L, Woodard, uh, Wood, W O O D A R D. There's no extra W in that one. All right. So Colin Woodard.com. We've got lots of great shows coming up. Next week, we're going to hear from Ted Shred from Pirates for Hire. And he's got, he's got some pretty amazing stories. That's going to be a good one. We're going to talk to the guys in Rusty Cutlass. That is the pirate band that plays at Walt Disney World in Florida. Uh, had some great talks with those guys. Uh, Scarlett Deerheart from Deerheart's Doodads is coming up. Marcus Redeker, the, uh, another very scholarly pirate writer. He's the author of Villains of All Nations. That's coming up in a couple weeks. So lots of great stuff coming up. Keep on listening. Again, those show notes are at underthecrossbones.com slash 121. And I'll see you next week. Bye.